Okay, I think we're about uh, ready to start. Did everyone get uh, enough sleep last night? No? No, I don't think uh, anyone does get a lot of sleep at uh, any Vintage Computer Festival. Um, but uh, we have a very special speaker for you this, eve uh, this morning. I didn't get enough sleep, as you can tell. Um, VCF was uh, started by Salam Ismail, and he is here right now on your screen. And uh, he opened up the first... Uh, <laughs> opened up the first one 25 years ago, and so he's here to give a talk on 25 years of vintage computer festivals. So, uh, Salam, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Vintage Computer Festival Midwest. I apologize I couldn't be there in person. I had uh, tried to make it happen, but I just couldn't. I uh, would have loved to have been there in person, but uh, this will have to do. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the history of uh, the Vintage Computer Festival. I uh, have some notes prepared. And, um, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the other things that I did uh, uh, with uh, around this uh, area of vintage computing. And then, uh, if possible, we'll take some questions from the audience if there are any. So I'm Salim Ismail. I'm the founder of, Vin of the Vintage Computer Festival. Um, this is the 25th year anniversary of the event. Um, so I first came up with the idea for the Vintage Computer Festival in 1997. Um, at the beginning of the year, I got I, I found an invitation to join a Usenet group. Um, I think it was comp.sys. Old computers or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, it was started by a guy named Bill Whitson, um, and. Uh, by then, uh, you know, I, I had accumulated a, a collection of about 30 computers, 8 bits, and some S100 machines, and uh, didn't really consider it a collection. I was actually holding on to them because I felt like they were being thrown out. Uh, you know, people were just discarding them, and if if I didn't hold on to them, then nobody else would. I just had no idea that other people, you know, just didn't occur to me that other people had the same idea as, my, as myself. So I was just holding on to them, but now, you know, there's a, a, a group that I could join, and so I did, and um, it was uh, it was great. You know, there there, there was people from literally uh, well all over the country, and then there's uh, several people from uh, the UK, I believe, at the time. And um, so I got really interested in the history of computing as a result of that, and collecting computers. I started bringing out my old collection, and and uh, and then being in the Silicon Valley at the time, and also making a lot of money as a programmer. Um, I had plenty of discretionary income to go out and start looking for old computers. And so I did, I, I, I started to, to attend uh, or, uh, you know, visit all the different thrift stores. And we had several swap meets uh, going on at the time in the Silicon Valley. Every, every weekend there was something going on and uh, there was lots of surplus stores <clears throat> such as weird stuff and HSC electronics and Haltech and, uh, excess solutions and uh, several other surplus stuff was another, and they're all gone now, unfortunately. Uh, but in those days, I mean, you, it was basically just there was there was vintage computers in abundance everywhere you went. Um, you know, walk into a thrift store and there'd be, you know, at least one or two sitting on the shelves, priced at like five or ten bucks. Uh, I also used to post ads to the Usenet groups uh, for the Bay Area. Uh, you know, soliciting old computers that people might have had. And, and so um, uh, I used to, uh, you know, go uh, end up going to somebody's garage and emptying it out, filling my car up. And they just, so a lot of times I just didn't want to have to throw it out. And they were glad somebody was interested in taking it. So that's how I uh, built my collection. And uh, I'd accumulated, uh, you know, pretty quickly started accumulating, uh, you know, a, bunch of computers 50 100 200 300 my collection eventually grew to over 3,000 computers i really lost count but i know that i had a 10,000 square foot warehouse that i had filled up with uh, not only computers but peripherals uh which i you know put a focus on a lot of people at the time were focusing on the computers but i thought well it has to be you know you have to get the peripherals and the documentation the software because my intent was to be able to run these demonstrate them um, so forth. So I also had a huge library of books and, and magazines and things like that. Um, so after uh, several months on the list, 
uh, which continued to grow and people were joining from all over, uh, you know, all over the world, really. Um, I started to get an idea that, hey, you know, it would be great if we could have some sort of convention where we could get together and uh, and celebrate our, our interests together because the, the list was very became very active very quickly. And so I uh, I uh, pitched an idea to start a classic computer convention that was going to be the original name of it. And um, and it met with an enthusiastic reception. So I started to plan it. And that was about around May of 1997. Uh, I apologize for the train sound in the background if you hear that. Um, so uh, eventually, as I started planning it, I came up with a better name, which was Vintage Computer Festival, because I felt that was a little snazzier, and it, it embodied exactly what we're, we were doing, which was celebrating the history of computing. So the first Vintage Computer Festival was held on October 26th and 27th in uh, 1997. The Alameda County Fairgrounds in, in Pleasanton, California, that's... Uh, considered the East Bay of, uh, of the San Francisco Bay Area. And I booked eight speakers. Uh, the event opened with Bill Fernandez, who is, uh, if you're not familiar with him, he's Apple Computer employee number four. And he's the guy that, inter that introduced Steve Jobs to Steve Wozniak uh, back in high school. He was a great speaker. And then we closed with Lee Felsenstein and Bill Marsh, who had founded uh, Processor Technology and, uh, and created the SALT-20. And um, they actually brought along the, uh, the SALT 20 prototype and fired it up. And um, I don't think it smoked. I, it actually worked, uh, but it, it was suffering from bit rot. So um, it, it didn't, uh, it powered up, displayed a bunch of garbage on the screen. Um, and so that was pretty exciting. Um, so uh, around that time, uh, just to give you some context, you know, the Computer History Museum is the biggest uh, museum now. They have the largest collection of vintage computers uh a public collection at least and um they were just a a, a small little um they had a a, a a dinky or a dingy warehouse on the uh, moffett field air base in mountain view that they were storing their collection in which was most primarily made up of computers that came from the um boston computer museum uh which then which went defunct sometime in the mid 90s they moved the collection over to the west coast because i think they were chasing the money uh and um, Google.com domain name was only registered a month before uh, the, the first Vintage Computer Festival. And then uh, Silicon Graphics, which is now the headquarters, or, or which the, the, the headquarters building of Silicon Graphics at 1401 North Shoreline in Mountain View, uh, was that, you know, Silicon Graphics was a $3.7 billion company. That's now the Computer Museum itself. The Computer Museum acquired that building, I think, in 2001, 2002. So the first at the first event, uh, we had about 200 attendees, and I was you know disappointed at the turnout, uh, thinking that it wasn't a failure. It was a failure, but it was actually a pretty resounding success considering, um, you know how how nascent the hobby was at that time. And so, uh, you know, as I said, I continued collecting computers, and um, but when I was what I what I started to realize when I was out uh, out and about uh, meeting up with people uh, acquiring you know, different computers and stuff, uh, running into other collectors at swap meets and things like that. But in particular, the people who I contacted through Usenet or who contacted me through Usenet, uh, you know, I was, I started to get uh, a lot of amazing stories, uh, from people. And, uh, you know, I met up with, of course, a lot of people who were computer industry professionals and they'd been around since the fifties or sixties or whatever. And <clears throat> so, as much as just collecting computer, those actually collecting stories. And so I decided uh, that uh, the, the focus of the VCF would be highlighting those stories, those people, um, because they were, you know, the people are the most important thing uh, of, of all of this. Um, and so uh, the VCF uh, continued to uh, expand or, or, you know, the, the second event uh, was uh, held the you know, following year. 1998, 19, by 1999, um, uh, I, uh, or actually it was in 2000. So I, I had a, a friend from Germany, Hans Franke, some of you probably know him. Uh, and he, uh, he started coming to the event, uh, in 1998. So the second event, the first event, which he still laments, I'm sure to this day. Uh, but he, uh, expressed an interest in starting a VCF in Europe. So I collaborated with him to uh, start the VCF Europa, which is based in Munich, Germany. And uh, the VCF Europa is actually the longest running 
continually running VCF event. Uh, and it just held its 21st event earlier in spring this year. Um, and so then uh, in 2001, I decided I wanted to expand the event to the East Coast. And so I uh, organized the first uh, VCF East in uh, Marlboro, Massachusetts. I chose uh, that area because I felt like that. Was, I, well, actually, I did I did polling. I, I, I actually determined that that's where the, the most uh, collectors were in terms of the geographic area. So that's why I, I chose I chose uh, that area, but also because of the you know the history of uh, of DEC and you know the other, the other computer companies that were uh, that made that sort of a hotbed of computing uh, back in the day. Um, and then uh, after after that first event, I was con contacted by Evan Koblenz, who uh, also you know expressed a great enthusiasm for the festival and he wanted to get more involved. And so I took him under my wing and uh, it, he. Uh, helped organize the subsequent VCF events uh, after the uh, 2.0 event, which is uh, I, I organized the first and second VCF East events uh, in 2001, 2002, and then uh, I helped Evan take over and, and uh, coordinate after that, which was which was great because now we uh, I could focus on the West Coast event and Evan can focus on the East Coast event. And he did a great job with that, of course. Um, and then uh, all along uh, the way, I would seed uh, other events. If people came to me with an interest in um, starting a VCF, I would uh, send them um, a, a secret document, which was not so much secret, but it just had all of my, uh, you know, methodologies and and, and uh, knowledge and and experience uh, put down on paper to help somebody who wanted to start an event uh, do so, and. Um, um, that's how the VCF Midwest got started, which was in 2005. Uh, and then uh, there was a short-lived uh, VCF Southwest event uh, in, uh, out of the University of Texas at Arlington by Gil Carrick. And then uh, we have a, a VCF Southeast edition, which actually just held its ninth event last month. And then uh, I also blessed a, uh, some VC event, VCF events in the United Kingdom. And uh, we even had a VCF Italia in 2004. That, that only was uh, for a year. Uh, that one year. Um, and then I had plans to, uh, I wanted to expand actually into Japan and South America, but those never came to fruition, unfortunately. <clears throat> but, <clears throat> but so, uh, you know, there was events all over the, uh, all over the country and even all over the world now. Um, so, uh, uh, in, at VCF, after VCF 10, um, I was, uh, you know, pretty exhausted uh, between my work and, and, uh, and, um, you know, just other things going on. I decided to take a hiatus, which was only supposed to be for a year. Uh, but um, unfortunately, things uh, didn't pan out uh, in, in, as I had planned. And um, uh, so I, I, I left the scene for a long while. And in the interim, uh, in uh, around, starting around 2015, um, we I, I uh, uh, worked with Evan and a couple other folks to. Uh, Merge the uh, the organization into a new uh, nonprofit, which is the Vintage Computer Federation, and uh, and then uh, in 2016, um, Eric Klein uh, started organizing the uh, West Coast event again. So that came back in 2016 and can continue. We just had that event uh, a couple of months ago now, and um, and uh, so as far as the hobby, you know, uh, it started out from just an obscure pastime. Uh, that was shared by maybe you know, a few hundred hobbyists around the country or around the world to now I estimate there's probably tens of thousands of collectors. I'm actually, uh, when I, you know, I, I had, my focus had shifted away for so long from computer collecting, from the festivals and stuff. And when I left it, you know, it was still the, I think the, uh, the peak, uh, attendance at the, uh, VCF event in, uh, uh, by 2007, which is the last year I did, it was maybe around 700, 800 attendees across the weekend. And uh, now, you know, we're getting, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what your attendance is, but I, uh, from what I heard from Jim Leonard, Leonard last night, it's actually very impressive. Uh, over a thousand people uh, will attend the event this weekend. And so it's definitely grown. Um, I started coming back into it actually because um, in um, in 2017, my, my collection, uh, which had been uh, pared down considerably because of uh, a series of unfortunate events, I actually lost about 80% of it. Uh, through uh, some dirty dealings, uh, which I, I don't want to go on necessarily. Um, uh, I had about 1% of my collection left, and that was uh, 
it was sitting in a warehouse, not, I wasn't doing anything with it. It was just deteriorating basically. And I felt, well, I need to do something with this or else, um, you know, it's all just going to turn crumbling into dust at some point. So I started to sell off my collection, but as I did, I realized, uh, as I was going through stuff, um, I realized that I still had a passion for the Apple II, uh, material, which is what I grew up on and still enjoy programming to this day. And so I, I, uh, uh, started to keep, decided to keep those, but as I, um, you know, looked around for places, groups and stuff to sell my computers. I discovered that a lot of the vintage computing scene had moved to uh, Facebook. So um, I was never a big Facebook uh, fan at all. I had an account, but I never used it. Um, um, so I, but I, but I got on and started using it to uh, market, you know, the, my computer stuff and started discovering uh, all the uh, vintage computing groups that had sprung up in the time that I had uh, been out of the hobby and it was quite amazing to see uh so many groups so many now um and and um just the, the price of some things had had gone up uh, drastically you know from when you know from the early days in the silicon valley you know going to thrift stops and finding stuff on the shelves for five or ten bucks or whatever and now things were going for considerably more as i'm sure uh, all of you are aware I, I, there's a lot of gripes <laughs> uh in terms of how expensive some of this stuff is um but to give some perspective on that, at uh, VCF4 in 2000, um, a, a gentleman by the name of Ray Burrell, he started a, uh, uh, one of the first computer stores in the uh, country in, um, in the 1970s. I forget exactly what around what year. It was probably 76, 77 maybe. It was called the Data Domain. And um, I think it was actually in Illinois. I can't, I'm, I, I can't, I'm forgetting at this point. But... He had an Apple one that used to be on display in the store window. Um, I think he, you know, they sold a few of them early on when it first came out and then moved on to the Apple two. And he was at retirement age and, and wanted to sell it and came to me, um, uh, to a broker. And so, uh, we did, we, we held an, an auction at, um, VCF 4.0 and, uh, it went for, uh, $25,000 and, um, it sold to a collector in Japan. Uh, and then earlier this year, of course, uh, an Apple One was auctioned on eBay for a, a whopping three hundred forty thousand dollars. And um, and uh, the month before that, I think there was a uh, um, another one that was auctioned off for even more than that. You know, so everybody, of course, knows that the Apple Ones are uh, you know a big big dollar item at this point. And uh, actually, um, I actually brokered uh, the sale of six of them um uh, over the years um and uh, the most that i had uh, sold one for was uh something i think it was uh equivalent of twenty eight thousand dollars it was it was a sale in europe actually um so uh, um but uh, uh you know that just shows you the interest that has uh been generated now in in terms of vintage computing it's it's almost uh, i don't it's almost become mainstream you know where you see a lot of uh, old themes and stuff um even you know my my son likes to make uh you know videos and drawings and, and weird stuff that he sends me uh he, you know he's a young teenager and uh he incorporates a lot of uh themes from uh, vintage computer uh vintage computers and stuff uh, in into what he does and um a lot of it has become you know just part of the culture now um so uh i'll talk a little bit about vintage tech which i started in uh 2000 and uh, I'll, I'll share the screen here real quick. Uh, let's see here. I just wanted to show the uh, website. Uh, I guess I can't do that. Well, you can go to the Wayback Machine and, and pull up uh, vintagetech.com, which I still own the domain. And I'm going to be relaunching it, um, actually, hopefully sooner rather than later uh, with a new focus. Um, but uh, I provided a lot of consulting services uh, through Vintage Tech. Um, and the reason I, I started it was one day I was contacted by a gentleman who was a, uh, an engineer and he was asking if I had, uh, computers, uh, that met a certain criteria. So, you know, I, for every event, I would put out press releases and I would get a lot of, uh, you know, press attention. Um, and I would do interviews. I, I did, I did at least one live, uh, uh, interview on uh, a local news station in the Bay area. And so, uh, um, you know, there were stories out there and people started to find me, um, and learn about me and, and, you know, learn about my story and that I had, you know, a bunch of old computers. So this gentleman found out about me and 
contacted me and said he was actually working as a consultant for uh, uh, some attorneys uh, in a case that was actually involving e-machines, if you all remember e-machines and Compaq. So uh, uh, e uh, Compaq had uh, computers back in the day, if you remember, on the front of them, they had a little, uh, they had ports like serial ports and stuff like that. And there was a little flippy door um, that they, you would flip up to access the ports. And e-machines had copied that uh, design. And so they had been, they got sued by uh, Compaq for copying um, that design. And, and there was, and Compaq actually patented that, that the, the flippy door, uh, the way it functioned, which was kind of strange. But um, at any rate, he was looking for computers that had that sort of feature. And that, so that's, that's why he came to me. And it was then that I realized um, that I could uh, actually make a living doing consulting for um, law firms uh, as a, uh, for patent litigation um, in, in that realm. Uh, I had already thought of, uh, you know, loaning out stuff up to uh, movies and uh, television shows and stuff. Um, but that was a, a whole new um, field that I hadn't even considered. So I, um, so in, in 2000, I, I formally founded Vintage Tech and um, the services that I came up with that I would provide would be, you know, legal consulting for patent litigation, renting props to Hollywood and uh, for, you know, movies and, and, uh, and television uh, shows and things like that. Of course, data conversion and, and data recovery services, um, appraisals and brokering, and then also developing replicas and exhibits for museums. So I, I, uh, I did a lot of uh, fun projects, uh, did a lot of uh, legal consulting, um, actually uh, uh, testified as an expert witness in patent litigation involving Antec uh, a couple times um, in uh, Pennsylvania and uh, rented a Computers. My computers appeared in a lot of uh, movies and um, and uh, television programs. A um, uh, couple of the the movies were uh, Frost Nixon and um, there uh, the movie about Howard Hughes. I, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it. Um, and then also uh, lots of uh, documentaries and things. I actually played the hands of Steve Wozniak at one point uh, in a uh, in the A and E biography uh, of Steve Wozniak. Um, did a lot of data conversion. I did, and, and I would, um, you know, I did formats that nobody even heard of <laughs> anymore because I still had all the hardware to do that. Uh, so I did, you know, of course, punch cards and paper tape and magnetic tape. And um, one of the more interesting projects I ever did was recovering uh, photos um, and uh, some, some data off of uh, VHS tapes that had been used to record uh, images, uh, digital images of uh, sunken uh, treasure that was pulled up in uh, Florida. Uh, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, Mel. Uh, uh, I forget his name, uh, but it was a, a very famous uh, treasury hall in 1986. They pulled up the Spanish uh, ship, the Atocha, and, and it was there was like a billion dollars of gold and silver on that. And in fact, Jim Leonard uh, was uh, instrumental in helping me decode uh, the, the photos that I was pulling off of these VHS tapes that I had to put together. Um, you know, I had to get an old IBM PC because uh, the uh, the data was stored on VHS tapes in a format. There, there was two formats at the time. Uh, there was the alpha microsystems format, and then there was uh, uh, video tracks, uh, which was a might be confusing that. But at any rate, it was a really interesting project because I had to find all the old hardware and all the old drivers, and and then it would only run on you know period computers because of the timing loops uh, were based off of you know the original 8086 processor and everything. So I was able to successfully uh, recover that data, um, and then uh, I did a. Uh, I, I mentioned the uh, you know the, the brokering. I did a lot of brokering of Apple Ones. I was the uh, original Apple One expert. Um, did you know some a bunch of research into the into it? Contacted Steve Wozniak and Mike Markula, who was the president of Apple, to, to uh, you know try to understand figures and and how many computers, how many Apple Ones were out there, and so uh, you know I determined that there was. Um, from from through talking to them that there was no more than 200 made uh and then um um but then i also was doing a lot of uh, building a lot of replicas in um i think in um i can't remember the year it might have been 2003 i was approached by the federal reserve bank of boston of all places um they were putting together a computer history exhibit and they wanted to um uh, have a pdp8 and i i had a pdp8 a straight eight and uh, they were referred to me actually by the Computer History Museum. 
And even though the computer history museum had like five of them, they didn't want to loan any out for some reason. So they, uh, uh, they knew that I had one. So they referred the bank to me and, um, uh, you know, they balked at the price that I quoted them for renting out the machine. I didn't really want to rent it out because it's too precious and, uh, didn't really want to ship it halfway across the country. Um, so I, uh, I suggested to build a replica and they, they were interested in that. So that was the first time that I actually built a, uh, PDP replica. It wasn't a functional one, but it looked, you know, pretty good. Um, uh, as far as, you know, uh, mocking one up. And so I started to, uh, that, that became another, um, forte of mine. And, and I actually, uh, developed a PDP one replica, but that was a functional one based on the SIM H, uh, simulator. And, uh, but I actually, you know, made a, a, a functional front panel and, and, um, <clears throat> had a computer inside running SIM H that was interfaced to the front panel with all the lights and switches and everything. And, and, uh, it wasn't hundred percent accurate in terms of, I improved it over time because I actually built into building four of them. Uh, and uh, there was three full scale ones and then one, uh, kind of partial one. It was just the, the front of it that w uh, went into, uh, the museum in, uh, the, the museum of natural history in New Mexico. And that was part of uh, Paul Allen's, uh, Paul Allen actually funded that he, Paul Allen wanted to build a museum in New Mexico at the old MITS, uh, site, you know, where Microsoft started. Uh, he was wanted to, he, he was going to buy the building that they originally in and convert it to a museum, but it was in a kind of rundown part of town at that, at that point. And so instead he, he gave, uh, uh he funded, uh, the, uh, natural history museum to build a computer exhibit. And so that's where that ended up. And I built other replicas, like a, a replica of the, the first Engelbart mouse and, uh, a couple other things. So that was, that was pretty fun. So, um, at this point, uh, um, uh, I guess uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to, to, to take them. That's that's pretty much the uh, history of the BCF and uh, vintage tech. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take any. Thanks very much, Salam. I'm going to uh, ask the audience if they have any questions and then uh, relay them back to you. So uh, uh, does anyone in the audience have any questions for Salam? Show of hands. It's, it makes my job easier if you don't, but uh, I think it would make him sad if there weren't any. Okay, so we, that's uh, here. One second. Let me take this. We have a roving mic for. Hey, some Salam. Questions. How you doing? Can you hear me? Um, Salam may not be able Dagnan? to hear you, so I may have to oh, okay. relay your question. Okay. Can you? Anybody hear me? I can barely hear. But uh, go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to say I remember when you called me and offered me that Apple One for twenty-five thousand dollars. I remember where I was. I remember saying no. I remember getting yelled at for even thinking about it by my ex-wife, and uh, just I, I think it's a funny story. I don't know if you heard that. It was Bill recounting the uh, time uh, you tried to sell him uh, an apple for forty-five hundred dollars. No, no, twenty-five. Sorry, twenty-five thousand dollars. I don't but know if you remember this. This call. is Bill. <laughs> I tried to sell him one for twenty-five thousand. You were brokering it, and you called me as one of the people who might want it. And you gave me a chance to get it, and I remember. <laughs> I remember that. Oh. It was a mistake. I don't remember that. Bill says it was a mistake on his part. <laughs> yeah, it was a mistake on a lot of our part. I, I uh, uh, kind of somewhat regret not. Uh, jumping on a couple of deals I had. I'll tell you one quick story. Um, oh, by the way, first I wanted to show that I'm wearing one of the original nerd shirts. We used to sell a lot of these nerd and geek shirts at the festivals. So I just wanted to make sure uh, everyone saw that. Um, the At the at BCF 2.0, so this was 1998, I was busy setting up and everything. And uh, I don't know if uh, any of you remember Kai Colton back. He was a big time collector back then. And... Um, he had, we, I talked to him previously and, and he had told me, you know, he was looking for an Apple one and, and, um, I said, well, you know, I don't, I don't know of any available, but you know, he, he, he had brought along some traveler's checks to, uh, to splurge and, and buy stuff at the festival. So as I was busy setting up, a gentleman showed up, a gentleman, and he said, Hey, I, I have an Apple one. And he showed it to me and there it was like, wow. Uh, you know, um, and he said, I, I, you know, I'd like to, I'm trying to sell it. Do you know, anybody would be interested. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'd be interested, but I'm kind of busy right now. And I don't know, I didn't know how much he wanted for, for it. You know, I didn't know if I could really afford it. I figured, you know, back then, you know, maybe like $5,000. Well, the only price point we had at the time was, uh, 
uh, Steve Wozniak at a charity auction in like the mid 1980s paid $15,000, I believe is the story for an Apple one. Uh, but again, you know, that's charity. And um, so, you know, I didn't know what to even ask or whatever, but I was, like I said, I was too busy running around trying to get everything set up. But I knew that, you know, from talking to Kai that he was interested. So I pointed at him at Kai, I said, go talk to that gentleman. He might be interested. So, um, you know, I went back uh, to being busy and, and setting up the event. And then, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes later, Kai comes up to me. He's like, Hey, guess what? I'm like, what? He's like, I, I bought that Apple one. I'm like, Oh, you're kidding me. How much did you pay for it? He said $2,000. I told the guy, you know, I told him the whole story about, you know, that the, the Steve Wozniak charity auction and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, was, he was really upfront and honest with them, but he said, but look, I have $2,000 in traveler's checks here. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you that. And, he, and so he took the deal. So that was a pretty fantastic, uh, pretty fantastic score right there. And that was 1998. Uh, does anyone have any other uh, questions for Salam? I'll have to relay them because we don't have the whole place wired for microphones. No problem. It looks like there are no more questions. So uh, Salam, well, thanks. I just, very I just much. want to point out. I yes. just want to point out, by the way, that the. Uh, the banner in the background, that this is the original uh, Vintage Computer Festival banner that I had created in, uh, for the first event. Um, so I thought it would be nice to, to pull that out. It was a good occasion to hang that up again. And what vintage computer is depicted on the banner? Oh, so, so this, is, this is my uh, impression of a, a quintessential vintage computer, basically. It's sort of like a... Uh, uh, you know, maybe like a pet or a, uh, I, probably like a, uh, ADM 3A terminal, except it's not really rounded, but it was just something, uh, actually had, uh, a friend I grew up with, the graphic artist, and I went to him and, uh, I, uh, you know, gave him some ideas and stuff. And he's the one that actually came up with it. Uh, and so, yeah, it's just, it's just meant to be a generic, uh, you know, vintage computer from the seventies. And then of course it incorporates my favorite font. It's a uh, computer font. Uh, Salam, hey, we actually uh, have another question. Uh, what do you want to ask right. Salam? Uh, you've been asked, how did you get started with computers? Oh, okay. So uh, I became interested in them when I was around 10 or 11. Uh, I just started, I would go to the store with, you know, when, when the family would go shopping or whatever. And we go to a department store like Sears or whatever, you know, as my parents were shopping, I would beeline to the computer section and just start playing around on all the, uh, the computers that set up, which were usually like Commodores and Ataris and TI 99s, you know, and, and I couldn't afford one at the time. Uh, but, uh, that's where I started to just, you know, get my experience on them. And then, uh, I think the first time I actually was able to sit down in front of a computer was at my junior high in seventh grade, they had a computer club. And um, they had TRS 80s. Uh, and then when I was, so, you know, I was saving up uh, money because I wanted to buy one. And, you know, all my cousins actually had like Apple, Apple twos. Uh, but uh, one day I got a mailer in the, uh, we, we got something in the mail for advertising a timeshare uh, uh, campground or something like that out in the mountains. And so I, I begged my parents to, or, or the, the timeshare, you know, the, the, the advertisement was if you come and take a tour of our facility, you know, so they can try to get you to buy one of the timeshares, the, they would give you a free gift. And the free, free gift was a, a, a Mattel Aquarius computer. And so this was 1983. And, and if people know about the Mattel Aquarius, it was a huge flop, interesting little machine, but it was, it was a complete flop. And, and, uh, that was, uh, you know, 1983 was, was that the great, uh, home, uh, computer video game crash, you know, where, where, uh, um, just so, so as soon as the, the Aquarius came on the market, it was basically a flop because it was, it was completely outdated, it had a crappy chiclet keyboard and 4k Ram. And, you know, this was 1983, right? So, so they just kind of went straight to, you know, surplus basically. And so that's what this, this timeshare was, was given away. So, uh, I begged my parents to, to take me out there, which they did. And, and they went through the, the whole tour and then, you know, had to, go through the hard sell at the end, you know, where the salesman's trying to get a commitment from them and everything, but they're like, Oh no, you know, we'll think about it. We'll think about it. And so finally I was able to go and get my free computer. And that's how I actually, uh, that was my first computer. I had it for about a year and that's where I taught myself how to program on it and wrote games and, 
actually wrote a database to to store all my, my comic book collection in it. So, you know, I did stuff with it, but it was it was it was very limited. And so after a year, uh, and actually it's a gr- good question because this really gets to what how I got into computer collecting. Uh, after about a year or so, I sold that and uh, our Atari 2600 that we had so I could fund the purchase of my first Apple II. It was actually an Apple II Plus, secondhand Apple II Plus. And, um, you know, I was really excited about the Apple II Plus uh, because now I had, you know, like a, a real computer. But, um, you know, I actually regretted selling the, the Aquarius. I started to kind of miss it, you know, because of all the time I had spent in front of it. And so I vowed then that I would never sell any of my old computers after you know when i was ready to upgrade i was just going to keep my old computer because you know as nerdy as it sounds it was you know it's like an old friend right and and that experience i came to learn was is not unique you know there's many people who have that same experience where they just spent so much time uh in front of uh, their computer with whatever they're doing Uh, i remember acquiring a macintosh from a lady who was sad to see it go but she was glad that it was going into the hands of somebody who was going to preserve it because she talked about all the writing she had done in front of it all hours and hours spent you know typing in uh her, her work whatever she's doing and and so um so that's why i started to really it wasn't collecting it was accumulating old computers uh i just was d- decided i was never going to sell my old one and um and and uh because i had uh you know always been interested in the computers that I saw in the, in the department stores, like the, uh, Ataris and Commodores. I was always interested in, in, um, uh, in playing with those. And so, uh, I, I started to acquire computers from friends who were no longer in, you know, they might've got one for Christmas or whatever, but just didn't get into them. Uh, and so they didn't care about them and they would give them to me. And, uh, actually my, the, my first big score, and this is again, before, uh, I was a computer collector. It was before I even realized that it was there was such a thing. I, I was uh, at a uh, auction. Uh, there's there's it's like a swap meet up here in the Sacramento area, and uh, I remember coming across a stall, uh, and this guy had just like every old eight bit computer that I ever wanted to to experiment with, play with, you know. And I literally had to like walk around the corner and and calm myself down because I didn't want to you know, make this guy think like, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't want to express my enthusiasm in front of him because I didn't want him to, uh, to, to, uh, you know, charge me too much for them. So I, I walked back and, uh, I, I said, uh, I'm interested in your old computers. He said, which one? I said, all of them. And he goes, Oh, uh, okay. Um, I said, well, how much do you want for me? He's like, um, well, I don't know. Uh, you know, I said, uh, how about, how about five bucks each? Right. Cause that, there was about 20 of them, right? Actually it was about 24 of them. And he was like, oh, that's great, you know, and and he was he was he was really excited, actually. And I was like, oh, cool, you know, I, I got a score here. I think I ended up actually giving him a hundred bucks, but um, I ended up getting like a bunch of uh, uh, probably uh, Vic 20s, uh, a TI-99. I think there was one pet, you know, with the, you know, like like this and um, uh, what else? Probably some Ataris and, uh, uh, you know, that. So that was the, so that was my first the first, you know, the, the really the first call of old computers. I brought them all home. I cleaned them all up. Um, I plugged them all in, tested them all out to see which ones worked, which ones didn't. And, um, most of them actually still worked. And then I, um, uh, I packaged them all up. I put them in anti-static bags and then stuck them in boxes with, with foam peanuts and put them on shelves in my garage, uh, to basically preserve, you know, it was, it was, I, I I'd gotten to, to, to try out all the computers I never got to actually uh, use, you know, when I was a kid going into those department stores. And so it kind of uh, satisfied uh, that that uh, compelling urge, and uh, put them all away. And then, and then, of course, you know, when uh, I I founded uh, or or came across the list, uh, the mailing list uh, in 1997, the Classic Computers mailing list, which is still around, by the way, and I actually recently rejoined. Um, uh, you know, that's when I realized, oh, I have a collection. You know, and pulled them all out and started enjoying them again. So thanks for that question. Sorry, so we have uh, two uh, very hardcore collector questions here. Uh, what is your favorite piece that you've still managed to hold on to? And what is the piece that got away, the piece that you really wanted but could never obtain? Oh, that's actually a really good question. So I can probably name, uh, I, I've, I've thought of this often, uh, it's easier for me to name the computers I never got uh, versus the computers I, I actually did collect. Um, was you know Apple One got away from me. I had an opportunity actually to get an Apple One I, that uh, not the one at the VCF uh, that I talked about that Kai got, but uh, later on 
there was a guy who approached me and I think I probably could have um, got that for maybe five or 6,000 bucks. Never got an IBM 5100, um, which was uh, um, something I had wanted, always wanted to get for the collection. Um, but, um, you know, my favorite computer right now, uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Actually, um, I did start, you know, I mentioned that as I was going through my stuff and, and selling it, which I continue to do this way to this day, uh, selling, I, I thought I'd be done selling it all off, like, you know, in a year, it's been five years now and I'm still, I've still got a, a half a warehouse full of this stuff. Um, so, you know, it, I had an immense collection. You guys have to understand I had literally 10,000 square feet, uh, stuffed, you know, it wasn't just like, you know, there were shelves and stuff, but it was all on pallets at the time. Um, but, uh, um, what, uh, I, I, you know, I kept my Apple II stuff and I've continued to build out my Apple II collection. And I have actually an Apple II lab that I've built and I'm planning, I actually started an Apple II a channel on YouTube, um, that I only have one video up right now. Cause I've just been too busy with my other stuff. But, um, so I, I have a really nice Apple II collection, uh, with a lot of really interesting stuff, some prototypes, um, and uh, lots of books. I actually started a, a project to catalog, identify and catalog and acquire every Apple II book ever written. So hardware references and software references and things like that. So I have about uh, 346 unique titles out of about 600 that I've identified so far. And so that's kind of a project I'm working on. Um, but also um, I, I started a whole new uh, collection um, that I'm I'm, I'm going to keep it under wraps for now because I'm going to actually be creating a video series uh, on, on YouTube um, that'll be more uh, uh, kind of general computer history. And uh, it's going to, uh, I'm going to start highlighting and showcasing this new collection that I've been building. Or I'll just, I'll wrap it up then. If anybody wants to contact me, I'll just give my email address right now. Uh, it's uh, Salam, uh, S-E-L-L-A-M dot ismail i s m a i l at gmail.com and so if anybody has any questions or anything like that i want to contact me for any reason please feel free to do so salam dot ismail at gmail.com uh thanks again salam i know that you had very low bandwidth thank you all. from your location so thanks again all right thank you i appreciate it have a good time this weekend <laughs>